I'm Rick Harsh, and this is excerpt number nine in my uh, series of Corona Psalms dot book readings, um, in order of when they were published. The ninth book we published was this one, Raging Joy, Sublime Violations, by the master Chandler Broussard. It's a relatively short in pocket edition, it's uh, 189 pages. It's a short novel uh, written in opposition to Vietnam, uh, 71 to 73, I think he wrote it. And we're going to read chapter 13, or parts of it. Try this one on for size. Hubert Humphrey, looking surprisingly more like a soft-boiled egg than a triumphant Bolivian high-jumper, moved his toy airplane and his slingshot to one side of his desktop and began the arduous, though not necessarily luckless, task of writing his dear mom his, week, this, his weekly letter. Humph had been writing this weekly letter ever since the first time he had slept away from home, which happened to be the time he went to the Scout Jamboree in Cedar Bluffs. He was 13 then, and he jerked off a lot in private. He popped two lifesavers into his mouth and wrote, Dear Mom, you were wrong in your suggestion that I must be in a foot hospital getting my corns removed as a reason for my name not appearing in the newspapers all week. I have been on a secret fact-finding mission in Vietnam for the Daughters of the American Revolution. We must expose the truth of that icky situation no matter what parts of the Constitution have to be rewritten. Well, let me tell you, Mother dear, there are things going on there that would curdle the milk in your memorable breasts. Those Vietnamese are more than enough to make even George Washington weep. I'll itemize some things for you, and then, you'll, then you tell me why girls should not be allowed to fly B-52s. 1. Thousands upon thousands of otherwise unemployable Vietnamese women are employed in recreation programs by the cream of American youth wearing uniforms. What do these jades give our boys after taking their money and their primal juices? Sif, clap, anal anxiety, and beriberi, that's what. Two, vanity and sheer arrogance are hallmarks of the Viet Cong character. They don't have, oh, they are the most uppity bunch of twerps I ever heard of. They don't have the dignity or common sense to surrender to superior forces, and they keep talking about ultimate victory like they had an inside tip on the derby. They refuse to curl up and die after they've been hit by some of our finest bullets. They are thoughtless and rude when it comes to the accepted rules of fighting, such as forcing our boys to use flamethrowers to get them out of their tunnel hideouts. Also, they won't let our boys get a good night's sleep. They are always attacking our bases at night like hopped-up fireflies. I attribute their disgusting behavior to permissiveness in childhood. Those VC kids are treated too good. Spare the rod and spoil the U.S. Army, if you see what I mean. If the Viet Cong mothers of yesteryear had only spanked their children more, and I mean a lot more, we wouldn't have, to have had to come over here in the first place to set this ramshackle house in order. 3. Infiltrations. They're always coming around when they're not wanted. And the awful thing is, they disguise themselves as busboys, shopkeepers, old ladies, hookers, bushes, watermelons, and baskets of shrimp. As Jack Kennedy told me just the other day, conduct over flights for dropping leaflets to harass the communists, train the South, South Vietnamese army to conduct ranger raids and similar military actions in North Vietnam as m might provide, prove necessary or appropriate. That'll give you an idea, Mom, how close I am to the President and his intimacies. There are no secrets between us, and that's final. 4. Ill-advised and shabbily dressed journalists on the left wing, caring little about the eternal verities and even less about our balance of payments, have said that our forces are using napalm in Vietnam. That is a bald-faced lie, mother. American manhood 
dedicated as it is to the organic spread of democratic, democratic principles as a guiding light in the honest pursuit of their military careers, would never stoop to such underhanded, underham, <laughs> underham-handed chemistry. To give them the benefit of the doubt, I would suggest that what these pimply-faced scribblers really meant, before they were brainwashed by the VC in their own living rooms, was that our Air Force has been inextricably involved, way over its head, in rural detoxification programs there, aimed at stunting the alarming growth of marijuana. This program is not only gratuitous and self-serving, but it is also aimed at public health and diversification of crops and the eventual increase in height of the average low-slung Vietnamese peasant. Our top-level chemists have, therefore, developed a simply marvelous chemical bomb which, when dropped in the right places, destroys the peasant's urge to raise and smoke marijuana, a habit, need I say, which is even baser than three-fingered self-abuse. Also, I might add, Mother Dear, that one of the benevolent side effects of this chemical bomb is that it suppresses anti-American instincts in the lungs of the inhaler. So there you have it, the truth for once. Or, as Roger Hillsman was saying just last week, it is difficult, if not impossible, to assess how the villagers feel about our efforts. Furthermore, because Raj and I maintain a fluid flow of info between ourselves, it seemed obvious that putting up defenses around a village would do no good if the defenses enclosed Viet Cong agents. Finally, Mother Dear, I discovered something else. The Jokers in Hanoi claim we have been secretly bombing Cambodia and Laos. Balderdash. It's no secret. Everybody knows it. Well, that's it for now. Just in case you're wondering what your little boy did for social recreation while he was in Saigon, <clears throat> because all work and no play is bad for your kidneys, I'd like to rest your mind easy by reporting that he steered clear of all those lewd and rapacious bar girls who are cr crawling all over Saigon like flies in May, only with less respect for the inherent sexual decency of the white males away from home without their wives or mothers. Even though they flaunted their wares, top and bottom drawer, and promised me delights that it would have, would have turned Moses into a screaming degenerate, I stood my ground even though I was on their turf and outnumbered. Breasts and pelvises were flying at me from all directions, but to no avail. As my friend Walt Rostov has explained, we are the greatest power in the world if we behave like it. Mother dear, I took those words to bed with me every night behind locked doors because the cruel canniness of those female yellow hordes is beyond decent Christian description. Both you and Mother Cabrini would have been proud of me. That x lax you sent me with the fruitcake is beginning to work, so I must sign off now and run to the bathroom to make number two before it is too late. Certain members of our examining committee, holdovers from the first revolution, feel that the truth about Hubert can be seized by a microscopic examination of his stools. Others, including myself, firmly believe in the chairman's principle of self-reliance, walk with both legs. That is to say, a good revolutionary knows a shit eater when he sees one. It is not necessary for him to have his eyes checked out by Thomas Aquinas. <laughs>